Okay, got the signal. Okay, so we'll, we'll continue on here. We're getting close to the end. Cocktails are almost here. That's a good thing. But I want to start by thanking uh, Dara, uh, Jason, and Peter Renton for putting on this conference. They've done a great job. It's the first one, and it looks like it has enough interest. It's going to last a while, so I, I want to say thank you to you guys for organizing all that. Uh, today's panel is going to be on wealth managers embracing P2P as a new asset class. And I think it's obviously an important subject because in the end of the day, investors are the ones, for, certainly for the direct lenders, using investors' capital as an important part of the direct lending equation. Uh, secondly, the business is truly in its infancy. You guys saw some earlier some numbers which showed about $4.5 uh, billion dollars of origination done over the last seven years, and this includes global origination. And to put that into perspective, that's less than a small position in the PIMCO total return fund. Uh, and if you think about it from a money management perspective, in the sense of dedicated assets to direct lending, the number's still probably close to a billion bucks. So the industry is truly in its infancy, which suggests there'll be a lot of changes, and we'll hear from the, from the speakers today what they think about that. Um, a little background on some of our participants today. Uh, we have Stefan Kolu from Tomvest. And I think they are an interesting participant here because they were one of the very first large, prominent family offices. In fact, I think you were the first. I think so, yeah. And I think you were the first to make a dedicated allocation to the space. And so I think it's always interesting to hear from the early adopters why they did such. Uh, Brandon Ross is actually one of the early people involved in the space, also one of the early investors, I believe, in the LC Advisors Fund, and subsequently has gone on to create a dedicated fund concentrating more on small business. Us. And then Howard Friedland has been an experienced investment professional over a long career and has now started also a direct lending fund that will be specifically concentrated more on the consumer side, but I'll let them add details to that. And then finally, a little background on myself. I guess, you know, you're always supposed to try to look for unique things that you want to accomplish. And I guess the one thing I can claim in the universe is I am the sole C-level executive that have been both at Prosper and Lending Club in addition to having about a 25-year asset management experience. Um, I want to set a little bit of the stage for today's conversation because I think we've heard a lot today about what I would sort of see as sort of self-evident truths. And one of them is, is that technology is disrupting the way we deliver credit. And I don't think there's been any argument from anybody about that. The second has been about the financing gap that exists. And there's some debate on that about whether the banks will come back or not. I, I sort of feel that Frank Rotman's point earlier today about the regulatory changes and the capital ratio changes will be a little bit more permanent and keep the banks out of the space for a while. The pendulum tends to swing too far both ways. It clearly seems to be swinging against the banks. And that means, if that's right, this financing gap is going to be here for a while. Um, the third is that the small, what I like to call the small dollar credit market, and I would refer to this as $250,000 and below, consumer, small business, et cetera, is truly a huge market. A little perspective on that, it probably is about a trillion and a half dollars in size. It is bigger than the high yield U.S. corporate market today. And the other thing that you can see is that and traditional investors essentially have no representation in this space. And the importance of that is obviously it has unique fixed income attributes and short duration and high yield. So if you were to sort of imagine a universe where you find a 5% allocation from U.S. investors to this space, in order to capture short duration high yield, that would translate into about a trillion and a half dollars of money coming into the space. So it's clearly an uh, interesting subject to address. Um, fourth is wealth managers, specifically to two of these fellows here. Uh, they're a clear control point. And basically, if you study the data, wealth managers or financial intermediaries control about 90% of the capital that's invested in different asset classes. So are they going to be a solution to the problem in helping, or is the direct investing approach going to disintermediate them? And that's something I'd like to talk a bit about, too. And then finally, there's been a lot of talk about technology and the disruption and providing new credit, but I think the one thing that hasn't been really talked about, about a lot is the fact that credit is cyclical. 
technology will not solve the fact that credit will remain cyclical. And while these are good times post-09, there are going to be bad times. And there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers, not only on a company basis, but on an investor basis. And so one of the things I'd like to talk to the panel a bit about is how they see that. And then the other, what I guess I'd call sort of semi-sacred cow, is there's this notion that this asset class is non-correlated. I think I've heard that before somewhere. And then all of a sudden everything becomes correlated and then it's too late. So I think one of the things I want to address is what I'd call the notion that th is this a long-term sustainable return opportunity or is it a trade that's going to disappear either because the efficiency is going to wipe out the opportunity set and or the bank's going to come back in. Now with that, I'd like to sort of turn maybe each panelist and spend a few minutes of just describing some of the things they think are pertinent about their background and then perhaps start with answering the question, is it a long-term asset allocation opportunity? Yeah, perhaps I can give a little bit of background about how we approached uh, the initial, our initial exposure to the asset class, which was via Lending Club in 2011. We, we manage a fairly large pool of liquid assets, and what we try to do is apportion our risk among uh, as broad a, an array of betas as we can find. And this was uh, an opportunity to get direct exposure to consumer, U.S. consumer credit. So it was interesting from that standpoint. What we also try to do is balance our various exposures based on how those assets are going to perform in a period of high growth, low growth, high inflation, low inflation. So when we looked at, uh, at the assets that uh, were being generated by the Lending Club platform, they were particularly interesting. Short duration, high interest paper that you know, paid out over, you know, you know, every month over a three to five year term, depending on what, you know, what loans you acquired. That was particularly interesting to us. Um, you know, for a number of reasons. One, uh, the s monthly flow of P&I coming in meant that, um, you know, if rates went up, we could take advantage of that. And I think really, the, if they went down, conversely, you know, we would have some exposure. On the other hand, it would be balanced by the remaining portion of the book that was still out there. Um, I, I think the, the one area where the asset class was, would be at risk of taking it in the shorts is in periods of you know sudden uh, you know contraction in the economy, and I think you know the asset class survived 08 very well. At the same time, it was in its infancy, so I think the jury is out as to how that will how the asset class will perform should there be an 08 uh, event again. But um, you know, I thought it was very attractive from from our standpoint in terms of what we were looking for. Um, but I, I do think it is correlated. It's correlated to, to different things. It's, it's another type of credit instrument. So it's going to be as correlated to different environmental conditions as any other credit instrument with idiosyncrasies uh, um, that will result from its characteristics of being shorter term and higher interest. Yeah. Great. Um, so I wear two hats. As president of Ross Asset Advisors, I manage a small amount of wealth, myself, my family, and some clients. I'm going to try to talk more with that hat on than with my other hat as president of Direct Lending Advisors, which buys small business loans on the IOU Central platform. IOU Central wasn't here today. They look a lot like OnDeck um, and have been in business for a few years. So I don't tend to think of this space as being peer-to-peer -peer lending. I think of it as being private debt 2.0, meaning it's more transparent and it's more efficient but it's private debt, it's contractual, self-liquidating cash flow. And that's what I like. And on the wealth management side, I have taken a lot of assets out of the equity markets and out of the bond markets and put them into the kind of contractual, self-liquidating short-term cash flow that is private debt. So um, when you're trying to work with clients and help them understand why this is a good idea, you have to have a story. For me, the story is really Renault's slide that shows that um, uh, interest rates have fallen and uh, rates charged on private debt, in his slide showed credit card rates have not changed. So whether that's because of red tape and regulation, whatever it is about fractional reserve banking that has prevented the banks from forcing the rates down in these products, that's the story, right? We can charge a lot for this stuff. Um, what does it replace? Like I said, for me, it replaces uh, equities because I think especially as you push above consumer debt, my fund has 
returns more in the 15% range. As you push above 10%, you really start to get into returns where even with some kind of a small value tilt, emerging markets, whatever it is, it's tough to convince yourself that you're going to get returns at that level. Um, especially in IRA accounts. I think it works beautifully in uh, tax-protected vehicles. Uh, and also, of course, with the, rising, you know, with the possibility of a rising rate environment and the fear of inflation, I think it works well to, protect, to, um, to fit against fixed income. The interesting thing about private debt is it's not really, it doesn't exist in the asset management marketplace. Like I took a survey um, um, on, uh, on fund administrators. Opus is my fund administrator. And I took a survey uh, for them and uh, I was meant to choose what kind of hedge fund I was, and there wasn't private debt. It wasn't even an option. So it's sort of the double duty for wealth managers to both explain what private debt is and then convince people that they should have it. Um, the, next, the next question, I think, is sort of how do you do due diligence on this, this new thing? And I think that's where the transparency helps. Um, for the most part, these funds are almost completely transparent in mine. You can actually see what's in the fund. You can do the same thing or understand what's in the fund you know, when you look at lending club funds. And then the same, then the finally, the question I think is how do you convince investors that they should own this? And that um, has a lot to do with downside risk. So sort of working all the way back to your original question, uh, m most of the fear is not around what happens right now. Everyone likes the idea that they're going to get 10% returns in consumer debt or 15% business loans or whatever it is. It's, well, what will happen when there's a recession? The way I typically tell that story, in addition to talking about how Lending Club's data is available and you can look at the data and so on, is I pull up the Federal Reserve's G19 report and I show how persistent, I show there's $850 billion of consumer debt, and I show at what rate it's revolved for a fairly long period of time, 13%. And then I pull up another report on the Federal Reserve website, which has the default rates. It's the non-seasonally adjusted charge-offs for all banks. And what you can see there quite clearly is that charge-offs peaked, sort of post-recession charge-off peaked in Q2 2010 for banks at something like 10.97%. So this is a kind of a worst-case scenario in which the, raw, the gross rate minus the charge-offs rate was still positive, and that tends to settle a lot of people's nerves, um, and um, so that's usually how I tell that story. Howard? Somewhere shortly after the Stone Age, uh, I was teaching banking, and what's really exciting is this is a conference about not a new asset class, but one of the oldest asset classes. I think Renault said it really well this morning, which is you know, we've seen how technology has changed industries. So he used the example of the book industry. Borders has gone bankrupt. People are still reading books. They're just getting them online. Blockbuster's gone bankrupt. People are start, still watching movies. They're just doing it online. What's very exciting about this is this asset class, which is whether it's $850 billion of credit card debt or a couple of billion dollars of consumer debt or a couple of trillion dollars of consumer debt or five to ten trillion dollars of total debt has historically been the purview of financial institutions, primarily banks. What I think drove us all to be excited about this is for the first time that asset class, which is large and profitable and stable, is now available to ordinary investors, institutional investors. I, I've spent almost 40 years in the institutional money management business. And a year ago, we started direct lending advisors because we think that this industry, this distribution method, will capture an increasingly large percentage of global credit origination. And that, by circumventing banks, more of that income will wind up in the pockets of investors as opposed to financial intermediaries. Well, well, let's carry this down a little further. So one of the things we've seen, certainly in the money management industry, is that this intermediation process, ETFs are a good example of how people are deciding they're going to get an index or replace money managers. So specifically to a return asset that's 9%, 10%, 11%, how does the wealth manager fit into that? What is the value add that they bring that justifies their fee schedule associated with it? And is that a better way for an investor to proceed, or is it better to go directly, even if it's a captive LC advisors, just directly to a platform? And how, how would each of you see that? Well, speaking for ourselves, I, I, I think if you're going to participate in the asset class at scale, you really need a, an infrastructure to do so. And frankly, we don't have it. I think 
you would need someone like Brendan's group to do that. Um, I mean, if, if you're on the platform and you're buying in accordance with your own uh, uh, acquisition criteria, you know, you have to know what you're doing and you have to uh, have support. And most people are not going to be able to do that. And even ourselves, we're a fairly large uh, market participant. You know, we're in the Lending Club Advisors Funds. And I think for most retail investors, it makes sense for them to be uh, in the hands of someone like Brendan as opposed to trying to figure out how to do it themselves. Yeah. Well, so the answer for me on the fund side is that because my loans are not fractionalized, it generally makes sense for even fairly large investors to end up in the fund. Um, with respect to wealth management and what I do with clients when I'm trying to get them exposure to consumer debt, I generally always recommend funds. And the reason is not because I'm not sophisticated enough to use nickel steamroller or one of the other pieces of software to automate the purchase of loans and actually have low cash drag, buy good loans, and so on. It's really because um, uh, the funds the, the funds do a lot of things. One of the things that people sometimes forget the funds do is because they can adopt mark to market, the funds are able to net short-term capital losses and interest income, and that's actually something of real value. So trying to have a separately managed account as an individual investor can be difficult unless you want to end up with short-term capital losses at the end of the year that you need to do something with. So for me, you know, because I don't generally have a lot of client assets in equities, I don't really need short-term capital losses, and the funds make a lot of sense for that reason and then for also for the other reasons. I think we have both a short-term job and a long-term job as professional money managers. Short-term job is really pretty simple. It, this is a, an early marketplace uh, in terms of the assets that are being provided online. Uh, there's an opportunity to parse credit and find interesting opportunities uh, as the market is efficient and becomes increasingly more efficient as more data is available and platforms become more sophisticated. But until that happens, we're able to generate a significant amount of alpha and also a significant amount of risk mitigation uh, by using fairly sophisticated tools that we can develop as professional money managers to parse out those loans that have a much higher likelihood of becoming delinquent or defaulting. That's a short-term business model. Our long-term model, I'm, I'm very much committed to, and I've been committed to over 40 years, which is as an active money manager, Somebody has to hold the marketplace accountable. And uh, uh, I'm a huge fan of Lending Club. I'm a huge land of, uh, f fan of Prosper. They've taken very different paths. Uh, and, and Renault knows this. Um, I, I understand why Lending Club started Lending Club Advisors. Joe and I have had this conversation both at Lending Club and at Prosper. Um, and I understood that at the beginning. It was a great way to jumpstart this market. Uh, but if one were going to take any part, in a, you, I'm sure everybody has less than positive things to say about Dodd-Frank. But if one were going to take, take an experience away from the last financial catastrophe, it was that you're supposed to separate underwriting from investing. And unless we want to go back to the problems that we had in the last five or six years, the important role that professional money managers can play is by independently validating the credit of loans that originated. Lending Club and Prosper make a lot of money originating credits. On the commercial side, you know, the platforms that are emerging make a lot of money originating loans, and they should. Investors should take the time and have the expertise to actually look at those credits, analyze them independently, pass on the ones that appropriately should be passed on, hold them accountable for maintaining whatever the credit buckets and standards are and the pricing associated with that. And if we do that from the beginning in this industry, this industry will become very large and will live up to all the expectation. If we don't, frankly, we're on a path that will get us right back to the mortgage crisis of, of five years ago. I, I think one thing that has to, to, to develop in the market, and I think it's important to appreciate that the market is truly in its infancy. We're, you know, we're th three, four, five years into it. Um, what has to happen is you have to have the ability to trade the assets. We have to have the ability to go short this asset class, and market participants have to be able to express views as to whether to buy, hold, or, or go, go short these asset classes. Then we'll have to look at what the market yields look like relative to the underwriting yields. 
And I, I look forward to the day when the market uh, uh, platform operators have to uh, look at the variance between what, how they're pricing debt on the platform and how the market's pricing it. I, it'll converge. And I think those are good points. I mean, we certainly highlight, you know, you hear a lot about the principal versus agency that Howard was talking about. And certainly what you're talking about is a very hot topic for a lot of people, mm -hmm. which relates to how do you price these assets? Uh, what happens is the portfolios are tend to be new, particularly as you're adding capital, they're not seasoned. Understanding the underlying true return of the portfolio right. is hard to estimate. Any sense of actual market-based pricing right. is completely missing at this point. Uh, and in terms of that, and what I say is completely, I should say it's not easily available to people. I mean, how do you guys see the pricing aspect? And it, for the other uh, issue would be the custody-related issues associated with where the platforms originate and the assets actually set. Because operational concerns are obviously a major forefront for a lot of people who invest money in any asset class. Uh, so specifically to pricing, custody, how do you guys see the, those, those issues uh, in terms of your fund or your experience? Yeah. So um, obviously the industry, we talk about it as 1.0, 2.0. These are over very short periods of time. But the industry has gone through really a very a, a profound learning curve. I mean, if you look at pricing like-to-like -like credits today versus three or four years ago, uh, I think the average consumer loan is priced at about 400 bips higher than it was four, you know, four or five years ago. So some of that is because of the absence of competition from banks and sort of coming out of the, the credit debacle of 2008, um, we found out that you know, consumers will in fact pay more money to, to borrow and, and credit cards have raised corresponding uh, costs of, of putting money on their credit cards. So there, there's still a net effect of yield pickup for the consumer. Having said that, I think that the uh, platforms have become much better at pricing risk. They've also become much better at putting loans in the appropriate risk buckets. Uh, and I think we can expect to see that improve over time. I think each of Prosper and Lending Club on the consumer side and on the commercial side, I think, Brendan, you'd agree that every day that goes by, they're learning more and more about you know, how to make this a better asset class for investors, how to in put in place you know, better controls, enforce better disciplines, pick up traditional banking experience. It's an industry, this, this uh, distribution mechanism of the industry really came out of Silicon Valley, out of venture capitalists and technolo technologists, and there's a lot to learn from traditional bankers about how to, how to make these loans, how to document these loans, how to collect bad debts. All of that will, will make this a better asset class, and I think, frankly, what we'll look back and say, these were the halcyon days when these credits were significantly you know, overpriced and yields are much too high in the favor of investors today. I hope they stay this way a long time. But I think as it becomes a better asset class and as billions of dollars come into it, I think we can all reasonably expect that to see yields compress and should because the actual amount of risk on the assets that we're buying is much lower than the way these are priced. The parenthetical to that for one second, Joe, is the great thing that we like about traditional, what we used to call signature loans, is whether interest rates over the last 70 years, whether interest rates were low or high, signature loans at banks historically were priced between 14 and 16 percent. So these loans, these Prosper and Lending Club loans that you're looking at are priced virtually identically to the way banks have priced them for the last 75 years. I don't expect to see any meaningful change in pricing anytime soon. You know, if this is just debt, then it only has two characteristics that are associated with its pricing, which is the duration and duration risk and the credit risk. And I think a lot of the questions I get are, well, why is there so much yield here? And I think part of the reason why there's a lot of yield right now, and I don't know whether this will go away or not, but part of the reason why there's a lot of yield right now is because it's all just small potatoes. And we don't have huge buckets of money flooding in because what would they flood into? Are they going to, is a large institutional investor with a 5 or 10% cap on its ability to own a single fund going to participate in a $100 million fund? Maybe, but a lot of much bigger investors than that 
you know, can't even enter. So I think it will be interesting to see as larger buckets of money are actually able to enter this industry, whether it then moves the needle. And I think the countervailing force to that is, well, there's $850 billion worth of credit card debt, and this looks a lot like balance transfers into amortizing loans, and therefore the outsized returns could last a really long time. Okay, uh, to you, Brendan and Howard, specifically in terms of customers that you're talking to, what, what are their biggest objections and what are the ones do you think are real in terms of what, the, what they're thinking about in allocating capital to the space? You mean, um, uh, the, the, generally it's the, uh, the, for me, because I'm working with platforms that for the most part were not making significant amounts of loans in 2007, the big question is, well, how is this going to perform during a recession? And I kind of touched on my answer earlier. That's almost, that really, in a nutshell, is the question that you're asked, or that I'm asked, over and over again. And, of course, you can reflect on the, the G19 and what I said there. Um, it's also the case that with a product that has yields as high as it currently does, right, like uh, yields debt to investors of 15%, you could have a lot of businesses default and still protect principal. So 15%, that's one in every seven businesses on Main Street that's with an average history of 10 and a half years defaulting. That's an awfully big recession. And I think that helps people anecdotally understand how this whole thing doesn't just you know, doesn't just blow up if there's a big recession. So we primarily talk to large institutional investors and they put it into three categories. Yields are too high so they're not believable. Right? <laughs> or yields are too low because consumer risk, consumer unsecured loans are too risky uh, because they emotionally believe that the default rate on consumer debt is double digit and even if you can show them 75 years of you know, Fed data, they, they refuse to believe that the consumers actually pay back their loans uh, and only four to six percent of, of all borrowers ultimately default on their loans. So you have the people who think that, that yields are too high so there must be something wrong and the yields are too low because, you know, they don't, um, they don't fairly compensate for the risk that they perceive and therefore, this is a great opportunity because it's all about education. And I think Lending Club and Prosper have done a great job of educating the marketplace. Piece of Peter Renton, events like this, all the press that's coming into this marketplace is really beginning to educate the world that consumers, especially consumers in the United States, I don't want to speak about the rest of the world, we don't invest in the rest of the world today. But consumers in the United States have a very long history of paying back their financial obligations whether or not you believe it. They really do. And so this is an asset class that on an unlevered basis is an enormously conservative asset class. We talk to people about this being alt cash. We really think this is the alternative for a traditional, the, the cash component of, a, of an institution's portfolio just at a much higher net interest rate. You know. And, and I think we're beginning to get a lot of traction in that discussion. So for Stefan, a little different question, same sort of drift, though. You've put two, I believe, allocations into a Lending Club now and the two funds. That's right. And now you've had a chance to experience for a while, get some sense of results. Uh, they didn't pay me to ask you this question, but are you thinking of increasing <laughs> your allocation now at this point? Or what decides that decision of do we add more or not? Um, I mean, it really comes down to our internal risk allocation. Um, so you're right, we put an initial, an initial amount in 2011 and doubled up on it last year. Um, we've backed another uh, company in the sector called Cabbage and uh, um, did a facility with a, a group called Victory Park earlier this year. So I would say at, at this point we're probably well allocated to the sector, um, but it's certainly something that we'll continue to add to as, you know, the, the pool uh, increases in size. Right, and you have increased your allocation by the fact you've done these other things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's open hey, it up for... Can I, can I just address yeah. that as well? You know, from a wealth management perspective, a lot of what I'm looking for is underwriter diversification. So when I think about how much of someone's money I can put into this asset class, I'm really thinking of that and then also how much can I put at Lending Club? How much can I put at Prosper? Every time there's a new underwriter and there were stages full of them, 
it gets me excited about the fact that I have somebody else's equation that I can learn, come to trust, and then mm -hmm. um, you know, develop a fund around. So, of course, my fund aggregates small business lenders that mainly do daily repayments, but others will exist that will aggregate different types of underwriters. And I think that's what's exciting because what happens is you get client pressure because of the results to put more and more and more in Lending Club and Prosper. And there need to be other outlets for that. And I think that is what's evolving pretty quickly. And there's a lot of good still small and growing uh, private debt managers that will help um, you know, get those assets into these underwriters. Okay, well, why don't we open up for questions? And we've got a number of questions. All right, why don't we start in the far corner over there? Um, how do you guys uh, charge fees? How do you justify the client? And especially given what uh, Howard said, that it's sort of a cash alternative, can you then turn around and charge fees? So the question relates to how do they charge fees and how do they justify their fee level? Uh, I run a 1 in 10 fund in the direct lending fund, and I generally feel um, like that, that, that has felt like it's worked out. I'm not, I didn't come up with that. Um, uh, Colchis is a, f a fund that I've used. I've, pro I've used most of the funds in this space. I've used Howard's fund, um, and, um, the, but that fee structure has seemed to have been one that people, that people are willing to resonate with. It's sort of half of private equity. Um, and one of the ways that I explain it is not that it's so much less than private equity, but that typically the underwriter takes a fee. So it's almost like you have two partners in the ability of creating something investable, um, and um, people seem to be satisfied with it. Honestly, how many other ways are there to get 10% or 15% returns? It seems as if one in 10, now Howard's uh, fees are different and he can speak to that, but it seems as if ultimately the way, so the way the pie really gets divided, right, is uh, in my fund, it's approximately 18% or 17.5% gross yield. Uh, that's net of defaults, 1% for expenses, one in 10 is around 2.5%, and then the rest is for investors. So investors are getting 15, the fund manager is getting 2.5%. I don't know, it, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, I've thought about increasing my fee structure when I go to Europe or whatever it might be, but I think for whatever reason people have felt, and maybe it's just the kind of innate fairness in an industry that's sort of frontier and feels like we're trying to be good guys all around, but it's felt like the fee structure can be softer and we can be okay with that. When I ran my hedge fund, I ran a, a performance hedge fund in charge, traditional two and 20. Uh, when I started this fund, I did it with the, with the idea that um, it's a very different asset class. We shouldn't be paid to take risk. We should, be take, we should be paid to avoid risk. So we charge a flat management fee. We actually cap the expenses in the fund at 50 bips. Uh, we want to pass through as much of the income to investors uh, as we can. Uh, we think that's what brings a lot of assets to bear in the marketplace, and we'd rather run a lot of, a lot of money and see the industry grow. Uh, so fr frankly, uh, it's a fixed management fee and capped expenses. OK, I saw another some hands right here. Um, I have a question for Brendan about why the focus on business lending. And oh, um, the question was why the focus on business lending. Um, because uh, I, it, I believe that it is, so, so Noah was here talking about how uh, how what he's doing is uh, creating new, completely new credit for people who were not able to get their credit, uh, as opposed to on the consumer side where it's, it, it exists. I think part of the reason why the yields on the consumer side are a little lower is because it looks, like I said, like kind of balance transfers into amortizing loans. On the businesses, they're just willing to pay, <laughs> creditworthy businesses are just willing to pay astonishing amounts of money. Um, and to me, it felt like that was where the absolute most money could be made um, with the shortest duration. So, uh, you know, tw 12 months or less uh, and just incredibly high rates and low defaults. Um. Other questions right here? Yeah. Uh, question for Brendan Howard. Um, other than security selection and diversification, how are you guys hedging credit rates in your funds? So we're not yet, but we think what will come with size uh, is the ability to both provide a traditional structured product to be able to provide some kind of principal enhancement to those investors that want to take less capital risk. Uh, we also think that long term there'll be insurance protection 
uh, that you'll be able to buy to, to, again, ensure capital preservation for those institutions that are willing to trade current income for you know, capital preservation. I think both of those will come as the asset class grows. I mean, this may come off as unsophisticated, uh, but I don't have really any intention to, to address that. I think the yields are strong, and um, to the extent that the risks aren't well understood, as I said anecdotally, the world would have to be a very different place for <laughs> principle to be invaded uh, you know, in a fund like mine or in any fund that does private debt right now. Question right over here. Yeah, it, it's. An, I mean, it is an interesting question. Uh, you know, one possibility is with the uh, interval fund, which, for those that aren't familiar, is a kind of a closed-end fund that caps redemptions um, and makes them available on a quarterly basis to people who schedule in advance. So that would that would fit well. Um, and I do know someone that's thinking about that for this space. Um, I think it's difficult in the absence of the liquidity, um, uh, you know, that you were talking about, to envision a, just a completely straightforward fund that could have a run on it. Um, it's it's that's a bit challenging right now. It is challenging. In addition to that, there's some security rules that define them as similar securities. You have consultation risks that they won't allow you to even create the fund with. In addition, pricing is a critical element to it, and of course, liquidity is also. So I'm sure they're going to figure a way to solve for that, but it's not going to be immediate. Yeah, I don't even know if it's necessary from the standpoint of the amount of capital, the amount of loans that are available to buy are just so small that that amount of loans can be purchased easily by institutions and, and, and uh, family offices. So we're not running out of supply yet to the point where it needs to be, those, where all those things need to be solved. All right, so we, we're running out of time. We'll take one more question. I thought I saw somebody here who had a question. Yep, right up here in front. I actually wanted to ask you, Joe. Um, can you give me your perspective on, you were both places, you were lending clubs and you did the advisory, I guess, at lending clubs? That's right. Is, does it, uh, when, when Lending Club goes out and speaks, they don't really mention that all that much. Um, you don't, you've never felt an inherent conflict about both uh, producing the, the, the it, it's all, yeah, it. no, it's obviously a hot, it's a hot topic question. A lot of people see that as a potential conflict. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, as was answered earlier by Scott, it was set up to be specifically an index-based approach right. that didn't yeah. have any preferences. It would buy basically everything par a pursue with the platform. So I think that avoids some of the conflicts, but again, it's always going to be a question for people if that's there. And I think it also brings up the bigger question, which is an integrated asset management vertical, a better solution to it, well, or is it independent? independently putting a screen on top of something that they, the platform's great, I'd love to sell against all day long with somebody that's buying the generator of that. Well, I think that's, I mean, I think that point, first part of the point's exactly right. The other side of the point is you could make the argument that if they become principals as compared to agents and are compensated as a principal, then you have an alignment of interest. Okay. Yeah, that, that was an issue when, when we looked at uh, the LCA funds. And from my standpoint, you know, you know, the LCA funds are basically selling the beta. It's a small, transparent management fee. And, um, as between the funds and the self-managed account investors and the third-party funds and levered funds, as Scott said this morning, there's a fair apportionment among those different constituencies. And I think they're very sensitive to the reputational risks uh, around uh, being seen to favor um, their own funds. So that was a concern that I had, but I don't think it's a material one at this point. I have one comment to add on that. You know, in this room, there may not be a lot of people who have an appetite for the conservative credit fund, which is sort of the broad-based fund's little brother. Uh, but the conservative credit fund is an index fund that generates returns of 55 or 6.5%. I have one client in it. Um, and that's probably not a fund that could sustain a lot of high management fees, but it's a great fund, and a lot of people who are skeptical of the asset class and want a toe dip could find themselves in the, in the conservative credit fund. Okay, I want to thank everybody, and I think we're going to look like we're going to get the hook here. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.